he told me, first, I want to be very sincere with you. Okay. The one who operated on you the first round removed your right ovary and your right fallopian tube. Why? How? I was not told so. He said, yeah, the one who did that, I don't know them, but I am a doctor. And what I've seen, I've, you don't have an ovary, you don't have your right fallopian tube. I remembered when that doctor was telling me, you are right fallopian tube is so blocked and buried, you can't see it. He knew what he had done. Instead of removing the cyst, he removed together with the ovary. When now you are about to lose your uterus, that is when people come in and they start giving you their ideas and solutions. Yet they had all the time in the world to come and help you. Now when it has gotten worse, now this one calls, do this, there is this doctor, this is the phone number, call him, he will attend to you tomorrow, he is ready, he will talk to you. Another one calls, hey, do this tomorrow, hey, I have spoken to another pastor, this pastor is marvelous. When he prays to you, that uterus won't be removed. Another one calls with their own opinion. At the end of the day, you are all causing panic to me. When I came out of theater, I was now begging God to die. The pain was too much. I was crying, shouting. The guy who was with me, he has marks. I was literally fighting knocking the walls i was i have never felt that pain in my life and this nurse is busy telling me stop making noise we are tired you are shouting and shouting and shouting if you keep quiet that is when you won't have pain and then i'm telling them please this is my third surgery i have never come out of theater with pain do something give me a painkiller inject me i want to be injected when he arrived, he threw me out of that bed. I was even sleeping because I had taken this sleeping pill so that I sleep. He lifted me up from that bed and told me, pick your bags and get out. Now I'm even like, where were we? Oh, yes, he has a baby and he has another wife. For the first time in my life, I begged a man. I even went down on my knees and I told him, please, wait until it's morning so that I go. If you throw me out right now, the neighbors will know and I don't want to, to feel that shame. So now everyone now started telling me, grow up, stop doing that. You are very dramatic. Everybody has problems. They don't even know this man is lying to them. So my name is Irene Wambua, I'm 32 years old, married for 11 years, but my marriage came to an end and I was left by my husband because I could not conceive. And after a lot of scans, reports, tests, I realized I have, I have been suffering from fibroids, blocked fallopian tubes, that is bilateral hydrosulfings, ovarian cysts that have recurred like twice, and severe endometriosis, which is the major thing in infertility. I eventually lost my uterus because of the severe endometriosis and the multiple fibroids. My childhood was a, a very nice childhood. I come from a family of eight siblings you know we girls when you finish school that adolescent part you feel you are the most important person in the streets so i walked out uh, of course with my parents blessings and i came to nairobi and i started looking for work so in between looking for work i got this charming handsome very cute guy and i immediately fell in love yeah, you know, there's a difference between loving someone and falling in love. Yeah, this was the only man that I had known since I was born. I started, actually, I literally was looking for him. I could not sleep. 
and eventually also fell in love with me. At that time, that was back in 2009, I was very young in marriage, but love had blinded me. All I wanted was to be with that man. No, I could not listen to anyone. So after come 2010, I decided to do the shortcut, which is not advisable. <laughs> but I went and started living with him. So due to pressure from my parents, I had to take him to my home place. And we did a very minor introduction. So my family got to know him. Then we went back. I continued living with him. This time he took me to his home. I saw he is uh, from a single parent. So he introduced me to his mom. Then we left back to my place. So at this time, I was really pushing him to marry me in the right way because we had already started living together. So I would keep on pushing him, let's go back home. When are we going back? Let me meet your sisters. Let me do this and this. But uh, it was taking his time. So uh, 2010, 2011, now I really wanted him to marry me the official way. So at this time, as a woman, I was curious, why am I not getting pregnant? I see all my age mates, they are getting pregnant, but I'm not getting pregnant. So that got me thinking a lot. At this time, he had stopped the thought of going home again for a second introduction. It's like he sensed something was not adding up. So 2012 came and went. 2013, mid-2013, now it was serious for me. I was now not understanding what is happening. And he too had started sensing there is a problem. So every time I would have my periods, I would die and then resurrect maybe after the eighth day. I would bleed, I, will, I would cry in pain. But I could not tell anyone. I could not also tell him. He used to get bored with me telling him I'm in pain. He did not like that kind of stuff. So one day I decided to go to the hospital and I asked the doctor, what medicine can you give me so that I don't have painful periods? And he told me, um, I will go and do uh, something called ultrasound. No, I'm very fresh. I don't even understand what is an ultrasound. So I went and had the ultrasound scan, and I, the same day, I went back to the doctor and gave. No, I was not patient at all. At this time, I was speeding everything. I just want to get pregnant and secure my marriage. The thought of my husband leaving me or another woman chipping in would really mess me up. If only I could get pregnant, then I would not lose him. So at uh, one point, when I returned the results to the doctor, he looked at the results and said, you have a mass inside your uterus, and it's three centimeters. So I asked him, so what, how many centimeters do I need for that mass to be big enough for me to be pregnant. And he told me, you do not need to have that mass at all. It's not supposed to be there. And I asked him, what is a mass? And he told me it could be a fibroid. He said, wow, and what do I do with it? You need to come back for another appointment and you see a gynecologist. I said, okay, can I wait for him today? <laughs> he said, no, go back, we will schedule a uh, an appointment for you. Fast forward, I went and I saw that gynecologist. I was just asking him, I am in the hospital, I'm supposed to listen to him, but I'm the one asking him questions. Why don't you do this? How about you give me medicine so that maybe it shrinks? And he said, unfortunately, I wish I could, but I can't. So he said, for me to confirm if that mass is really there, uh, first of all, it's very small for you not to be pregnant. Second, it is the one probably making you have 
painful periods and over bleeding. I said, yeah, so what do I do? Let's do another scan. And this time, this scan will confirm if that mass is really there and we will know about your fallopian tubes because this mass does, can't make you not conceive. I actually asked him, do those people who have that mass you call the fibroid, are they the ones who are called barren? I did not want to hear that word barren because now I was so worried. So I went to this facility in Nairobi. Uh, by the way, if you know you work in a hospital or any facility that deals with handling a human being, you better be in good moods or have that heart of helping people. Because by the time that person lands in your facility, maybe they have gone through a lot. And at this time, I was hiding it from my husband. I did not want to scare him. I did not even tell him I have a mass. So I went to this facility and I was to be done a scan called HSG. For those that have done that scan, they don't need to be reminded about it. I thought it's something that I'll go, they check, I go. So I went and the first thing you, you get into the, to the receptionist, very two beautiful ladies but they can't even give you the audience. Very serious doing their stuff. So I'm like, hi, no response. So I stood there until one now decided to look up. Yes, so I produce my request form and I tell them I'm supposed to have that scan. So she looks at me again and she's like, when was the last time you had your periods? I had been coached by the gyna that it's supposed to be done 10 days after your meniscus. So I told them the date, it was correct. So I paid some cash and I was told to wait. At uh, that time, there's a medicine you are given and you wait for at least two hours. They were the longest two hours in my entire life. So I went and I had the HSG scan. The person who did the HSG scan, it was, of course, around seven years ago, but I can still see his face. A very rude man, old man. I always thought that old men are the most gentle. That man was very rude. So when he's doing the scan, for the first time I'm being told to remove my clothes, I am like, no. Remove. I removed. They, I was being assisted by a, a lady. After I was done, I was told, now you need to spread your legs. I refused. They told me, in this, what we are doing, by the time we finish, you will not even need to be told to put your legs apart. You will do it on your own. You are, or I'm already here. Um, they've, now, that is not something you tell someone. I wish they would have been nicer. So when that radiologist started doing what he was doing, I was crying and shouting in pain. So at one moment, when he was struggling to push in the dye, he, he said, let me look at your tubes. They are blocked. Huh? I heard him say, my tubes are blocked. Oh, wow. I even stopped feeling the pain. I just, I could not wait for him to finish so that I can go and call the gynecologist and ask him, what, how do I need to open my tubes? I've been told they are blocked. So after the scan, I went back to the gyna. The gyna told me first the fibroid was one, that was now confirmed. And my tubes were blocked with something called bilateral hydrosulfings. Apparently it's a liquid that has filled your tubes. Now all I needed to know is how am I going to have this? Now, now I needed to get pregnant. So I went back home and I told my husband. I wish my husband could have been nicer but sincerely speaking, he was like, it's okay. You can even adopt if you don't have, you don't have to have your own. So I'm like, huh? You don't tell someone you can adopt when they are trying 
their best to have that does not work at that time so actually we were on bad terms and he even left left me it was during a holiday he left me and he went to his home so what i was doing was trying to get pregnant so i did not care whichever treatment i got from him any woman who loves a man they do their best to keep him so when he told me that and he went i cried my heart out i googled before i saw that gynecologist with that report I had known what is bilateral and dorsal things, how it is impossible to conceive with that. I went and spoke to the guy and he told me the only way he can do is if I go, I have this surgery, but at the moment it can't help because if I go for that surgery, I will have very minimal chances of conceiving. And number two, those tubes will come and get blocked totally. I asked him, why? He said, fallopian tubes are a size of spaghetti. And if you temper with them, and then they heal, they now, they totally now get stuck permanently. I asked myself a lot of questions. At that time, <laughs> that is when I started loving God. I would pray in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. When I'm walking, I'm talking to God. So now this fibroid had started growing. So uh, in around 2015, I, now my husband started getting lost. I would see him like two days in a week. In the weekend, I would never see him. At the same time, where I used to stay, I used to say, I think women, sometimes we are our own enemies. You see, these ladies, when you are staying in a place and you see each household, there's a woman who is getting pregnant. You see, they are pregnant in a very short while. Ah, they are carrying their second pregnancy and you feel so left out because they think you are slaying. That's why you don't want to get pregnant while they are giving birth. And actually, at some point, <clears throat> they don't even talk to you. You say hi. Mm -mm. You feel so rejected. You feel bad, so isolated, you ask, how can I get pregnant? But it, it does not happen. After 2015, my husband now disappeared. I asked him, what's up? He said, I have meetings somewhere, so you can't see me during the weekend. I said, okay. So one day, he, he borrowed my phone, and he went with it. And when he came back, I took my phone, but he forgot to delete some photos. So I saw a video whereby he was holding a baby and talking and feeling very nice in a different house. And I remember the face of that baby. I used to see it on his cover photo and he had told me his sister had given birth. So I, I even felt bad because I said, wow. I wish it's mine. I wish I can give him that baby so that it's our baby. So I really need to have this baby. Wow. So when I asked him, he said, I told you it's my sister's baby. And at this time now, he had started getting violent. You know, sometimes we women, when you love a man so much and he gets to know it, he can do anything to you. At this time, he knew he was my savior. He was the only thing I loved. So he would do anything he wanted with me. If I spoke anything or anything, or shouting, I would be beaten or get some several slaps. So now I have seen this baby, but I do not believe. Mm. One day he went and he really stayed like a week without me seeing him. So I took my phone and decided to call one of his sisters. <laughs> that sister, I asked her, where is so and so? And she said, he is with his family. I asked her, which family? He got married and he has a kid, he's moving on. He told us you separated a long time ago and he even took the wife to the parents. That's the one we know right now. I'm very sorry, but he said you separated a long time ago. My heart started 
pumping very fast. My legs could not, I could not stand. I started sweating. I was alone in that house. And funny enough, my periods were late by seven days. So at that moment, you know, I'm in that panic mode, huh? My own man, my, my soul, he has a baby and a wife who already is introduced to the family. <laughs> I, I did not even cry. So I took the phone and decided to call him. I called him. By this time, I think the sister had communicated to him. He did not pick my calls. But he was very mad because I had reached out to his sisters. I went and I said, before I do what I feel like I want to do right now, let me go to the hospital because my periods are late. You never know, maybe I'm pregnant. This is the day God wanted me to be pregnant. So I went to the hospital and I lied. I don't have a, a, a full bladder so that they do the blood test. Maybe it would be more uh, effective. They did the blood test. I was not pregnant said okay i was given i had some sleeping pills by that time so i went with the sleeping pills at home before that i called one of my sisters and i told her so and so has a baby somewhere else and i did not know this time i'm crying and she tells me pack your things and go home I disconnected the phone there is no one who is even at least start starting with a sorry. Don't don't lose hope. Be like this. I'm very sorry to say this, but I have had a very unsupportive background. So I have been used to keeping my own problems and not talking about myself to anyone who knows me. Actually. I feel better when talking to strangers because I think they can't judge me. When I called my husband, I, he said he is not coming and it's true, he has a bit, he's now giving it to me straight. And he feels it's not working, so we should just separate and I should just pack and go home. <laughs> that is something, in a day, it's the same day I've discovered he has a baby. I cannot have mine because I have issues. And at the same time, I'm being told to pack and leave my home, my home I clean, I, it's mine. I'm being told to go, it's not working. And this is someone you love very much. I could not take it. I waited for him to come. And I told him, you know, if you, you continue telling me to go, I feel like I cannot do this. You know, at, when you were given a news, at that time, you are crazy, you are not yourself, you can do anything. I told him, I am not going to continue living. You've left me, you are telling me to go home, and you, you are not even sorry. I told him, I have sleeping pills here, and I'm going to take them. That was a way of scaring him to come home, and indeed he came. came very light, late at night, when he arrived. He threw me out of that bed. I was even sleeping because I had taken this sleeping pill so that I sleep. He lifted me up from that bed and told me, pick your bags and get out. Now I'm even like, wh wh where were we? Oh, yes, he has a baby and he has another wife. Oh, hey, so how, how now you start questioning him? Why did you not tell me you have a baby? So it was literally, practically, chasing me out. He went to the other bedroom, picked my bag. He took it and he was throwing it, doing crazy things. At this time, I had to calm down and reason out with him. For the first time in my life, I begged a man. I even went down on my knees and I told him, please wait until it's morning so that I go. If you throw me out right now, the neighbors will know and I don't want to to feel that shame. At the same time, um, he has already taken his phone and calling my dad, something I would not have wanted my dad to know because I'm still in shame. I don't want to know them that I can't give, but by they not being able to conceive is something that makes a woman feel so isolated and shameful. You just, you are just in there. And said, come and pick your daughter. She, 
I am tired of her because she wants to kill herself. You see what I said? Now, from whom all my sisters think Irene wants to kill herself. They don't even know the reason. And yet, at this time, I was scaring him to come. So now everyone now started telling me, grow up, stop doing that. You are very dramatic. Everybody has problems. They don't even know this man is lying to them. In the morning when I woke up, he, he agreed that I can wait until morning. So he went to work and I said I will not go home. I lit a jiko full of charcoal. I made sure it's full. I have never even told him. He does, he, he, whatever he is, it's going to surprise him if he finds out. So I lit up that jiko and I put it inside the house and I closed the doors and every opening in that house and I put it in my bedroom and I took those sleeping pills and swallowed around, if not 16, 20, between 16 and 20. And I said, I cannot keep on crying, no. In fact, at this time, I was not dying because I can't conceive. The fact that he was leaving me, I could not take it. So I took and I slept. I woke up in the evening around 6. I could not see. My head was in a lot of pain. I was vomiting, throwing up. Then I realized even the jiko had burned totally. There was nothing in that jiko. That's when I remembered I had tried to commit suicide and I did not die. Immediately I saw my phone call. It was someone was calling. It was him. So it was like, have you already left my house? I told him, no. Now I'm even confused. I don't know if it's morning. I thought it's morning. And I told him, have you already left for work? And he was like, what kind of questions are you asking me? Have you, if, if you have not left, you should know that if I come, I will literally chase you. So fast forward, I managed to go home. My mom welcomed me. I stayed for around two weeks. I could not live without him. <laughs> I begged him. We, we fight until the last minute. I begged him and I managed to go back to him. We started living together again, but at this time he told me, do not expect me to be always there and committed. Me, I've told you I have another family, so now it's about you now to decide. I took that one. I, could, I, I preferred being close to him than away from him because of love. Love. Love can be crazy for a woman. If we love, we love. But when we come to give up on that person, it's, it's done. At this time now, I started thinking about doing something better for myself because I now knew my marriage is, and I'm not conceiving. I tried herbal medicine. I would do anything. This herbal medicine costed me a lot of money. I would spend 3000 in a week. I took this medicine, and funny enough, the fibroid shrank when I went for another scan. I had no fibroid, I was so happy. The fallopian tubes, actually the liquid was reducing. Oh my God, I was the happiest girl. I knew I am now getting pregnant. I did not lose hope. <laughs> After staying and doing a lot of fights with my husband and trying to keep my marriage, I decided now because I had gotten at least something from that marriage, I could now go and look for work anywhere. So I used wisdom and I told him, I need us to separate. I go to another place closer to my, to where I'll be working. So yeah, but at this time I'm trying wisdom to separate with him through a very nice way because at this time I discovered it's not working at all. And even the baby mama was giving me hell. I have gone through a rough life as a woman, as a small girl. I went again and I saw my gynecologist. He told me to do another HSD scan. I remember that painful scan. But I went to a different facility. When I did that scan, now the fibroids had come back. This time four. 
Remember the first time I had one. This time there are four. My fallopian tubes still blocked. But my left fallopian tube somehow patent. That's how they call it. Being patent is open. When I went to the gynecologist, he told me now, because the fibroids are back, still we can't remove them. There are only four. If we remove a fibroid, they come back and in multiple. I said, okay, so why am I experiencing pain? I went in for another uh, ultrasound scan. This time, I was told I had tried fertility pills called Clomid, six circles, cycles that is. It had not worked. They had not worked. So I was given a higher dose of uh, another one called Letrozole. For those trying to conceive, they know Letrozole. I was told uh, the disadvantage of these pills, you are in bad moods, and if you happen to conceive, you can get twins or triplets. I said, that's exactly what I want. <laughs> so I took them without thinking twice. Every time I'm marking, I had even set an alarm. I did not care how much I had spent on those pills. Little did I know that when I'm taking these pills, they are supposed to maybe, I think, make your ovules get bigger. Yeah. At the same time, they were making my fibroids grow bigger. And at the same time, they gave me something called ovarian cyst. So at this time, the gynecologist told me to stop. When I stopped, he said, we are going to monitor these cysts if it gets bigger or if it's, it shrinks. Because I wouldn't want you to go to the theater and have it removed. But if it gets past five centimeters, it's dangerous. We have to remove it. One day, the pain was too much. I went to the doctor and I told the doctor, please, this one, this time was my second, or a second opinion. He told me to go and have another scan. I went, I have used a lot of money on scans. I went and had that scan. Now the cyst had grown bigger. It was even past, I think it was six. And they said, we can't let you go. We will have to remove that and uh, I will look at your fallopian tubes, see what I can do. The, f the mentioning of see what I can do, oh, I agreed immediately, okay, but I won't touch the fibroids. I said, no problem. Why wouldn't you touch the fibroids? He said, it's dangerous if I remove the fibroids. Chances of uh, uh, they, they can come back in multiple. I said, it's okay. I went for the theater. That husband of mine, the reason I loved him, by the way, he used to love me too, but may I say I'm a woman who has lost a home because of my body. I always blame my body. It has made me lose a home and someone I loved. He was with me that day. So I went for theater. But when I woke up, I discovered I had been opened up. I had that open surgery. But we had agreed with the doctor I'm doing laparoscopy. So after I, I was better, I asked the doctor what happened. You are not to cut me open. He said, I saw those fibroids were so big and they would disturb you. And I just thought of removing them for you. I thought it would be better for you. I said, Oh, okay. How about my fallopian tubes? Um, your right fallopian tube is totally blocked and buried, I think, where I don't know, it's three intestines. Uh -huh. How about my left? Your left fallopian tube is open. That one you can conceive with it. Oh, thank God. Uh -huh. So, but you have one more problem. What? You have severe endometriosis. And what? What is that? He told me those are scarring tissues. What are scarring tissues? Before he finished explaining, I did not even understand anything. He told me, for now, go try and conceive with your left tube. But with the endometriosis I saw in you, 
I think it's going to be a tough journey for you. I did not listen to him. I went and I tried. After four months, it did not happen. At this time now, my, hus my husband and I we were not doing fine and we eventually separated. And that is when problems started in my life. If I have never borrowed money from you, anyone out there, it's because I don't have your number. From a beautiful house with everything, I sold everything. I have separated with my husband. I'm now someone who needs to be on painkillers. I am trying to raise up, try to see if I can pay my house rent, moving into a smaller house. Life had become gone upside down for me. I would wake up in the morning and look at myself. I don't understand how I'm at this point here, sleeping down. Like, uh, I was crying day and night, but when I go out, I'm very strong. I smile. You see people walking out there and you look at them with a very hateful face. You don't know what they are going through. At this time, when I see a pregnant woman, approaching me, I would divert. I hated to see a pregnant woman anywhere around me. And if I discover you are pregnant and we live in the same area, I would avoid you because I don't want to see you, because I, I know you are going to give birth and I don't want that process. If you are my friend on Facebook and I discover you are pregnant and you start making those photos and oh, you, your baby, your husband, I look at you and I say, oh God, this is what you've denied me. I block that person so that I don't see them. After a very long struggling life, when I was left with my husband, at this time I had not started working. So after a while, God was merciful and he gave me a job. And after struggling, now at this time I knew I am not married, so why should I stress myself with getting pregnant? But in between, I got this guy who is saved, by the way, and he told me God has spoken to him. Mm -hmm. And God has said he will take care of me and marry me. And in fact, he asked me, would you like a church wedding? I'm like, oh yeah. But I did not have that love I had from my ex-husband. The love had gone, but I'm trying to make it happen by force. Now, when this guy we have met, I have not told him I have an issue. But as we continue dating, I tell this guy, by the way, you know, I have been hospitalized, by, I, I think, twice. I have this condition, and unfortunately, at the time being, for the time being, I can't conceive. And he said, don't worry. I will love you the way you are. I'm even going to pray for you. You are going to get pregnant. Just wait and see. You will get pregnant. After we finish that wedding, you won't believe. I did not know this guy was. I don't want to use the word conning. This guy was not working. And you see, I have gotten this job. And the guy is not working. And... I was also fooled by his looks and the way he's saying he's, he loves me and his charming words. Uh, by the time I realized I was doing the opposite, I decided now to stay back and see how it goes. And unfortunately or funny enough, he did not follow up on me. So I thought, oh wow. It was all about my money. It was not about me. This thing pained me a lot. Now I, now I started hating myself. I started feeling bad, so bad. But God, God loves me. He used people. God has used people who have taken care of me. You see, when I was with my husband, he was the one taking care of me. He would pay my NHIF bills. And when we separated, I, I even put my NHF card somewhere and forgot. And I said, I can't pay for that on my own. 
but God used a very nice person who, who paid every shilling for that NHF. He did, he tried all his best. I can call him like as someone who is God sent. And I know maybe we will come through this. I am so grateful. He paid for every scan, every ultrasound, anything that I needed in the hospital to know what is my problem until the last minute when I was told now my my fibroids have come. Remember I had been, four of them were removed. Last year when I was going to work, it was very early in the morning. You know when I wake up I used to take three types of painkillers. Immediately when you wake up, painkillers. After I leave the door in the matatu, I will take another round. And before I alight from the matatu, I will take another round. This time, I took those painkillers. They were not working. I was like, what is happening? But I do this every morning. The pain was too much. So I went to the matatu. But before 15 to 10 minutes, I collapsed in the matatu. So from what I gathered later, I, when the matatu now, the passengers told the conductor, there is someone here who has collapsed. So a lady came and took my handbag and she looked at another bag I had. That bag I had packed my lunch and anything I needed for the day. So they took my phone and the lady called my niece. The last number that God made me not to have uh, any password on that phone. So she called and my niece picked and she was like, do you know a brown small girl from a certain place we are, we are coming from a certain place and heading to town and she has collapsed and she was like oh yeah is she like this and this and she said yes she's my auntie where are you what has happened and all that so they she took the phone now the passengers had to come out of the matatu and the matatu reversed back to a hospital for me when I woke up, the first person I saw was my two in-laws in the hospital. I was, now, I remember, now I was asking myself, where am I? I see white people, the nurses and the doctors surrounding me. And I thought, I'm in heaven. No, I'm dreaming. No. When I looked at this side, I saw my in-law coming, walking very fast with this Bible. He's a pastor. He has really helped me too in this journey. Then the pain started and I remembered, wow, I was in pain. I was shouting in that hospital. I was in the emergency room and I was crying, shouting, standing on the bed. I was doing all sorts of things. Immediately when they saw I, um, I have an operation, they decided to do a scan. And when I had that scan, I was told, the, the person who, this is another person now, who should not be working in a hospital a radiologist. I don't know what is wrong with them. So he is doing the, whatever he's doing and then he's saying, have you, do you have any kids? No. I think you should go and have your uterus removed. Huh? Why don't you have your uterus removed? This thing is not making sense. It's so damaged. I, I even sat down. I remember sitting down and I asked him, why? Do I have fibroids? Because I remember I had them removed and they say, yeah, and they are multiple. They are too many. We can't even count. So I asked, how big are they? In fact, I found myself asking him, so the largest, because you know by the largest how big it is. So I'm asking him, how much is the largest? Instead of asking him, how big is the largest? I found myself asking him, how much is the, uh, the largest? And he said, are you going to sell them? I said, oh no, I meant how big is the largest? He said, uh, the largest I can see is four centimeters and the others are very small, very small, and there are very many. And if you stay for long, they are going to get bigger. And just go and have this uterus removed. I kept quiet. Oh, and you also have cysts. Huh? What cyst? You have an ovarian cyst. I was told cysts don't come back. I had mine removed with fibroid. Because you have cysts. 
and this time on the left side. But to are right, there are no cysts. Okay. I kept, I just said, okay. You finished, and I went and showed my in-law the report. I started crying, and I, the first thing I told him was, I don't want to have another operation. And he said, don't worry, you won't have another operation. Before we finished, I was told I collapsed again. And this time, I had to be taken to another facility, the one that I have registered with my NHIF. So when I went there and I woke up after theater, I saw my bag on the top, the side of the table. And I remember what is inside that bag. It is lunch. I had carried lunch. And I thought, wow, you wake up, you pack your lunch, but you don't know that day you will wake up in a hospital with your lunch there, but this time you can't eat it. Wow. I could not talk. I was so weak. And I had a friend calling my name because I had refused to wake up totally. I was still sleepy. I struggled to open my eyes. I could not. I, now I remember that I was in the hospital. I have had that surgery. Now I had my friend calling me, Irene. Irene, I was so happy to hear a voice from someone who is not a doctor and who is, does not work in a hospital. I felt so good. So she held my hand like this. And before she took her hand, I refused with, I just wanted her to keep on holding me that hand. Sometimes in life, you don't need your money. You just need someone near you. That is all you need. Uh, uh, fast forward, when the doc doctor came to see me when I was being discharged, he told me, first, I want to be very sincere with you. Okay. The one who operated on you the first round removed your right ovary and your right fallopian tube. Why? How? I was not told so. He said, yeah, the one who did that, I don't know them, but... I am a doctor, and what I've seen is you don't have an ovary, you don't have your right fallopian tube. I remembered when that doctor was telling me, your right fallopian tube is so blocked and buried, you can't see it. He knew what he had done. Instead of removing the cyst, he removed together with the ovary, and they did not tell me about it. They, they, hide, they, they, they refused to tell me. So he said, I have managed to remove that cyst. It was very big and it was so bad. I think it was coiling on my intestine and that is what was causing the pain. But my dear, he tried with the sweetest words possible you could tell me. Please, I know you are a woman and you want to have children. You have very severe endometriosis. Hey, okay. And your uterus is so damaged. You have a lot of fibroids. And I asked him, why can't you remove them? You should have removed one one. He said, no. Number one, you are very weak. You don't have enough blood. And they can't, they can't be touched because they are very small. You can't remove. By the time you finish, you might not even wake up. So I asked him, what do I do? Go home. Think about it. We don't have to do it now. Take it, be fine, relax. After six months, come and I remove your uterus. I did not say any other thing. I just say, okay. The only thing that I wanted was to go home. So I called my in-law who came and picked me. And at this time, I just wanted to be alone in my place. But I was smiling and I was so pretending I'm very fine, very strong. I did not even tell him anything. I was like, uh -uh. do you need anything? No. I went in the house. The moment I dropped my bag, and when I was walking in the gate, you know, my in-law is a man. He doesn't understand. And at this time, my family members are not around. So the taxi that is carrying me, imagine you are from operation, 
and you are carrying your heavy bag and you are not supposed to do that. I carried that bag like a normal person. I even tried to walk straight. I open my gate. I even meet some neighbors and I'm like, hi, hi. And I walk inside in the house. I close the door. I drop my bags. I cried any tear that would have been inside me. I cried it that day. And I even, I had not thrown away my lunch. I asked God, this is the food I was to eat three days ago. I did not know I would come back to this house with another stitched stomach for a second time. My God, where is your mercy? My, I, I have, at the moment, my house is like a prayer center. That is a place I just talk to God every day. I eat my prayers because I don't have any alternative. No, money cannot even save me at the moment. It's only God. Fast forward, unfortunately, I had to lose my uterus. I think three months ago, the pain came back. It was too much. I went to the hospital. This created a lot of family misunderstanding. They thought I was creating drama. They thought I was joking. They did not understand the problem I was in. Actually, at one point, my dad told me to wake up and go back home, to be discharged immediately and go back. The doctor had to talk to him and tell him, if you can come and see your daughter, you would not say that again. In fact, we need you guys to come here and donate blood for her because she doesn't have blood. I had to be hospitalized for a week before that procedure. I had no one on my side. When you hear someone has been hospitalized, please, even if that person, whatever that person had done to you, go and see them. They will feel better if they see you. I was alone. When I was going to the theater that day, I had to speak to a boy who I call a brother right now. I had to talk to that boy to come to receive me after the theater. I had no one, no one. Before the theater, I had no one even to bring me food. But the people I was relying on, you see, they think I'm creating drama and causing panic, especially to my mom who is not very well. And that is the last thing I wanted my mom to go through. Then there's something else. When now you are about to lose your uterus, that is when people come in and they start giving you their ideas and solutions. Yet they had all the time in the world to come and help you. Now when it has gotten worse, now this one calls, do this, there is this doctor, this is the phone number, call him, he will attend to you tomorrow, he is ready, he will talk to you. Another one calls, eh, do this tomorrow, eh, I have spoken to another pastor, this pastor is marvelous, when he prays to you, that uterus won't be removed. Another one calls with their own opinion. At the end of the day, you are all causing panic to me. At this time, what I wanted was, it is going to be well. It is fine. It is, don't worry. God does you. But what I was getting is, you are doing the wrong thing. You regret. Seriously, at even one point I thought, what? Maybe I should listen to these people. I might go in and even not come out because it's maybe it's a sign. I should not do it. But at the same time, I'm in a lot of pain. If you see a woman ready to lose her uterus, do you know a uterus is your, my life, my generation, my everything? If you see someone ready to lose it after 11 years, just know they have done their best and they're in pain. And I was tired of feeling pain. When I went to the theater, I was begging God, but I had very nice people who were praying with me. I was asking God, please don't allow me to die. I don't want to die. The doctor said I don't have blood. Please do something. In fact, make it possible for the doctors to remove the fibroids and my uterus to be intact. Me, I knew when I go, I had prayed. I knew when I go to the theater, 
I would come out with my uterus. I was praying to God to do a miracle that it would be possible for the fibroids to be removed and I would come out. <laughs> when I came out of theater, I was now begging God to die. The pain was too much. I was crying, shouting. The guy who was with me, he has marks. I was literally fighting, knocking the walls. I was, I have never felt that pain in my life. I don't understand it's because it's part of my body. Now, when I'm crying in pain, I'm calling the nurses to come and assist. <laughs> and this nurse is busy. You see, now you are stitched. And at th that time, you, you don't even move, you can't. So they come and throw me like this, I face upwards. That pain of turning me like that. <laughs> I even kept quiet and looked. Now I opened my eyes. You see, you, you are still in anesthesia, you can't see. I had to open my eyes and look at them because of the pain. They've turned me like this. I managed to look at the bandage, it was bloody. I tried to look my legs. I saw the gown I was wearing, blood. I immediately closed my eyes because I was fearing. And this nurse is busy telling me, stop making noise, we are tired. You are shouting and shouting and shouting. If you keep quiet, that is when you won't have pain. And then I'm telling them, please, this is my third surgery. I have never come out of theater with pain. Do something. Give me a painkiller. Inject me. I want to be injected. And the, the, she said, we cannot inject you. We've already injected you. Wow. I wanted to die at that time. I saw water. You know, you're not supposed to take water. I was waiting for the opportunity that they go and I take that water. I was tired of pain, but they were not understanding me. Now, imagine you've been operated on. Something has been removed. And now there is something that is inserted inside you. I've never understood up to date what was that. Because during that time, they were making sure they've inserted that thing to end a well. But I, I said, what is that? And immediately they stepped, I managed to hold that. I don't even know what it was because I held it and I pushed it. And the moment it fell on that bed, I felt relieved because I think, I don't know what it was, but it was part of what, if it is a part, they should just have given me a pad, but not to insert in those things inside me. When I pushed it outside, I felt better. And then that, I will never forget that day. And those nurses, I know if you hear, please, you made me go through a terrible pain and making sure the catheter by force, they were just doing what they were because they had not even seen any family member. I was alone, so they did not care. So I imagined if maybe someone was with me, they would have treated me with caution, but no one was there. And after I was fine, the doctor came and he explained to me, I was even showed the uterus and I saw the fibroids. It was looking bad. And they said, you see now, Irene, maybe God decided you'll never have children. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can adopt. Believe me when I tell you right now, telling someone they can adopt does not make them better. No. In fact, you are just reminding them of what they are facing. He needed to do to organize for a counselor for me. I refused. I think I've been shaped up by my problems until I'm the one who counsels people right now. I don't need, I have tried. Yes, there's sometimes I go into depression. You wake up in the morning, you look at yourself, you ask yourself questions, you don't, you answer yourself. And then you are like, wow. The only thing that I ask God nowadays is peace and some little joy. I ask God, please, I know I don't have a uterus and I'm trying to work. 
give me some joy, joy of smiling with people and just being normal like other people. That is all I'm, I'm not even asking you for children anymore, no. I'm not asking you to refund my uterus, no. I just need joy and peace, that peace of feeling you're okay. And when I think too much, I think about the positive side, I say, okay, I don't have my uterus, but at least I don't have to have painful periods. I console myself. And then I say, I don't have to have labor pains. But sometimes when I see someone holding their baby, I can give them what I have in my pockets to pay them, to give me two minutes to hold. I love small babies. When I see someone holding hers, I feel I even smile at them so that they can see I'm friendly and then maybe they just give me that baby to hold. Or if I happen to sit behind someone holding a baby, I stare at that baby until they are light or I arrive and that way. I have come to accept myself and what I have gone through, it was bad. I have I've gone through that journey alone. I asked God, losing my uterus is one thing. Did it come did it have to come with a top up of rejection? frustrations no one is understanding me all i needed was a shoulder to cry on i think up to date the only one who understood me was my mother because old as she is she managed to come to the hospital and saw me so when she would walk in the ward i would try and put a very smiley face and show her how strong i am but i was very weak very small so she would just encourage me and tell me to eat, yet I am eating, there is no appetite. But do you know something? When everyone you need leaves you, God connects you with other people. If 10 people leave you, at least there is one, only one who won't. There is one person who God leaves behind to take care of you. There is a neighbor who has tirelessly, she would come, you have been operated and you are alone in that house. The boy who was taking care of me, imagine when I was being discharged from the hospital, I needed pads and there was no nurse around. And I, I asked myself how I could send this boy to bring me pads. He doesn't even know that. I could not. Then, you know, at that time, you can't even have any inner wear. I took this bandage, the one you are, when you are inserted those needles, I took it and I cut a tissue paper and I started to stick, to stick it and stick it with the bandage, this side and the other side, so that it, it won't fall. And then I would walk in a style that no one would notice because they had no even no one to come and pick me up or even bring me the clothes that I would need as a lady. I was alone and I have a family, a very loving family, but I was alone. Yes, they were not around, but even a phone call I did not receive. But my heart is not bitter. I think it's a journey that God made me to go through for a reason. And I, someone told me I should be happy because God has used me as a sacrifice so that one day people can say, surely there is a God. If that is Irene, there is a God. I'm currently having a very nice friend. You know, when you fall down, someone can come and pick you. Okay, there are those that will pass, but there's someone who will come and pick you and help you dust yourself. I have a very, someone who has done that lately. I had stopped going to church, totally, because number one, when you go to church, you meet people who know you, and they look at you with a lot of questions, and you can't stomach those questions anymore. Not because of that shame, you feel, I don't need to go somewhere where people know me so i isolate myself too much 
sometimes I really look for someone to counsel me. Sometimes it really hits me hard. I, I wish to talk to someone, literally talk to someone, but you don't have anyone. You are left. Your husband left you. Another one came and dumped you. You are so alone. You feel like God is not there. But with someone who comes and tells you, Irene, you're going to be fine. You know what? Go read this book. Read this other one. Let me pray for you. Ah, that is very nice. In fact, since I started talking to that person, that is when I got the courage to even speak right now about no one knows about me. I always hide it from people. But after I spoke to that person, I started feeling I'm not rejected after all. There's someone who is seen potential in me. So I can still do it. I can still be a, no, a human being, a normal person. I don't have to feel that isolation. And there is no small problem. You know, people always tell you, you, what you've gone through is nothing. There are people who are going through worse or bad things. If I gave you myself and you go through what I've gone through, you'd even tell me to pick my problems. You can't manage. So there is no big problem or small problem. It's good to be near a person who is down. But so far, so good. I still have that family, which is so loving. Yeah, and um, some people have backed me up. And I was once told while in counseling, the more you talk about it, the more you accept yourself. When my uterus was removed, I asked the doctor about the side effects that I would face later. And he told me one thing, I am going to experience menopause symptoms. I could not believe the word menopause being addressed to me at the age of 32. I never knew that would ever happen. Then I asked him, how about, do I have any ovary or what did you remove exactly? He said, my left ovary is still intact, but it has cysts. And remember last year, there is a cyst that was removed from that ovary. So he says, I have insignificant cysts. But the prayer right now is that those cysts, they should not develop or get bigger. I don't know which, how to talk to God and make him understand that those cysts, they should not get bigger. Because if they do, I'll be back in surgery. But with that ovary, now the doctor told me that ovary will moderate my hormones. Of course, there are hormones that come with the uterus. But at the moment, I'm literally surviving with that ovary for hormonal balance. But sometimes you, your mood change, the one you call mood swings. Sometimes you can even wake up and just cry. But we are different. People are different. But as for me, what I've discovered, sometimes I'm very sad, very mad. I can wake up and I don't want to talk to anybody. And sometimes they can be very happy. So I'm trying to balance that, not to offend anyone when I feel down or not to be overwhelmed at the same time. The challenge I'm facing currently, I have told you I was alone during that journey. I have called everyone on my own accord. I have borrowed money to sustain myself. Imagine you are in the hospital. You pick your phone. Hi, please give me 300. I will refund. Mm -hmm. Okay, when? Next week. Okay. I have gone into debt and at the same time I have faced rejection. But I'm slowly managing myself. Mm -hmm.